Thanks, Nathan um, and Petar for having us here. Um, when we got this invitation, we were like, shit, <laughs> because we had, we were working on form at this exact moment, um, and we thought, okay, we don't, we kind of had this project on the back burner, and we were wanting to work on other things, or we had to work on other things, rather, and we were like, should we take this opportunity to, like, develop this project that is exactly on this topic, um, or should we be, like, pragmatic and do the things we're supposed to do? And obviously we chose to kind of dive in and take this opportunity to, um, expand this project, which um, we had started last year, and I guess um, we just want to say a few things about it coming into it, and one is that we've kind of think of it as um, a way of intervening in some of the debates around form and formalism that are a little bit specific to literary studies, and so we're going to kind of outline some of those for you today, um, for those of you who aren't in that field, but then Really, the other way that this project came about was um, wanting to really enrich our vocabulary around form in literary studies by bringing in some thinkers that we don't normally work with. And so trying to think about, okay, how do we get out of like the normal set of people that we're always thinking with? And so for us, um, a lot of this material is really new, both in terms of it's new for us writing it and the thinkers that we're working with were thinkers that we're newly discovering and excited about. So we're excited to share this work with you. Do you want to say anything? I just else? wanted to reiterate my thanks to Nathan and Peter and to everybody. Um, it was like an amazing week of intellectual engagement. Um, and maybe like that we come like to this material from different perspectives, uh, Pearl from late Victorian realism, and the shift that she wants to produce about like thinking realism in relation to modernism, and for me the opposite, working in mid 20th century Italian cinema and literature, looking how realism reemerges in Italy after modernism in the 40s and 50s, in, for instance, neorealism in cinema. So it's this kind of trying to reconsider the relationship between these two terms beyond like uh, the usual like dichotomies, realism versus modernism. So what we mean by an essential form has a lot to do on the backside of our head with this project. Yeah, and maybe we can talk in the Q&A a little bit more about our kind of text that, that we're thinking through this very, what, what is gonna be a largely theoretical talk without a kind of object in a way. Um, and I think also it'd be cool to talk in the Q&A more, because our talk is about form really explicitly, to kind of talk about the different theories of form that have circulated um, already throughout the week, also since it's the last day. Um, that would be exciting for me. Okay, so um, to begin. Our, our talk today works to excavate a genealogy of formalist analysis that stretches from the Victorian art critic John Ruskin to the early 20th century art historians Abby Warburg and Henri Faucillon, proposing that a fascination with what Ruskin in 1859 had called inessential form drives these three thinkers' respective attempts to reconceive a form as imminent to both matter and time. The theories of form developed by these three thinkers, while little cited in literary studies, destabilize many of our field's present day assumptions about the role of form in literature, from debates about surface versus depth to the distinction between historicist and formalist approaches to literary texts. They do so not from the perspective of the present, of course, nor from within the field of literary criticism but from within the still forming discipline of art history. At the end of the 19th century, art history went through a dense reconfiguration of its own disciplinary boundaries, transforming from a hobby for aristocratic connoisseurs to a scholarly discipline with its own theoretical stakes. This project of becoming art history was deeply marked by the attempt to define the notion of form. And yet, the theory of form that emerges at this critical juncture, we shall argue, was much more particular and peculiar than the notion of form one finds in present day new formalist scholarship in literary studies. Rather, in the work of Ruskin, Warburg, and Faucillon, we hope to show close attention to form was close attention to how feeling materializes. <laughs> 
that is, how emotionally charged energies crystallize into pictorial and sculptural details, flowing hair, intricately sketched earlobes, or billowing garments, for example. We argue that these three thinkers have something to offer literary studies in their approach to form, not as that to which an aesthetic object can be conceptually reduced, but as a quality of words that indexes affective encounters. So part one, formalism and the problem of reductionism. Our talk proceeds from an observation about form in more recent literary criticism. That to talk about form is to talk about something to which a thing is fundamentally reducible and as such essential to what that thing is. Far from rejecting this assumption, we merely want to name it in order to distinguish it from the theory of form we are interested in today, a notion of form which, following Ruskin, we call an essential. Our aim in what follows is thus not to offer a competing definition of form, nor is it to argue that we have enough theories of form and that literary critics are as such misguided in their attempt to produce a stable definition of form, nor is it to offer another new formalist methodology different from those literary studies already possesses. Our aim is instead, one, to isolate and describe a kind of form that is often flown under the radar in literary studies. Two, to further wrest form from any necessary connection to meaning, identity, as well as functionality. And three, to offer an account of what literary criticism can and often does do when it thinks, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, about form. The assumption that to think about form entails conceptually reducing things, including literary texts, to their fundamental patterns or shapes finds clear expression in one of the most recent and widely loaded instances of the new formalism in literary studies, Caroline Levine's 2015 book, Forms, All Rhythm Hierarchy Network. In Levine's forms, form is as fundamental as it is ubiquitous. It shapes everything from seminar rooms to poems to gender expression. In Levine's strategically broad definition, form is, and I quote, all shapes and configurations, all ordering principles, all patterns of repetition and difference. In a, in a, re in a recent essay that takes stock of a host of new formalist projects, Jonathan Kremnik and Anahid Narcissian call Levine's approach to forms reductionist for its attempt to standardize its key concept, form, and apply it to phenomena in fields of inquiry beyond that out of which it, it contextually emerges, that is, literary studies. Kremnik and Narcissian use the word reductionist, here notably not in a pejorative sense, though they do disagree with Levine's reductionism but rather as a descriptive term borrowed from philosophy that names the attempt to produce a general definition of the term that would apply across various fields of inquiry. But, but the word reductionist means more than one thing for Kramnik and Narcissian, and we are here more interested in one meaning than the other. While they initially defined reductionism as the attempt to, and I quote, furnish one's concept with an explicit definition that can also be used to explain aspects of the world, as becomes clear later in their essay, beyond a mere attempt to define form, reductionists, in their view, consider their key concept, and I quote, the ground upon which individual examples and instances depend and to which they reduce. So we want to drive a wedge between these two aspects of what Kramnik and Narcissian are calling reductionist formalism. Because we hope to convince you that it's possible to have a theory of form that holds across diverse sets of inquiry, and yet does not conceive of form as a fundamental shape or pattern that makes something the thing that it is. Indeed, the very premise of our talk that a theory of form emergent in 19th century art history has something to offer 21st century literary criticism should be enough to signal where we stand on the question of interdisciplinarity, as well as the question of whether it might be worthwhile to develop a theory of form that tracks across time, space, and sites of intellectual inquiry.
And yet, we find Kramnik and Narcissian's taxonomy of formalisms useful for its observation of the way that form appears in more recent literary criticism as both fundamental, to quote Sandra McPherson, it is a recurring pattern that makes something the thing that it is, as well as indisputable. For Francis Ferguson, for example, in an influential essay, form can, quote, regularly be found, pointed out, or returned to, and the sense of its availability does not rest on agreements about its meaning. So Ferguson is kind of saying that, you know, if, if you call something a sonnet, you might not notice that it's a sonnet in the first place, but once someone points that out to you, it's, it, it's an indisputable fact um, and something that you can return to and debate about other things outside of that. Um, so we're kind of pointing out the way that um, form in all of these theories is both fundamental and easily um, or e recognizable and indisputable. In their essay, Kramnik and Narcessian ultimately take issue with reductionist formalists like Levine for attempting to impose a single meaning on form, instead advocating for a pragmatist approach according to which form, in their words, is an entity known by occasion through encounters with its subsidiary phenomena. In what follows, we want to dwell in the conceptual tension between the opposition posited by Kramnik and Narcessian between having a theory of form that holds across diverse disciplines and sites of inquiry that I don't like, and having a known theory of form as inquiry relative, uh, which I like. <laughs> So in the following three sections, we thus address three thinkers who have a theory of form that both insists upon a specific definition of form and at the same time seek to account for form's context relativity. Ruskin, Warburg, and Fossillon would, in Kramnik and Narcessian's taxonomy, sure be categorized as reductionist in that they have a theory of form and that their theory of form is intended to hold true across diverse sides of aesthetic and intellectual inquiry. And yet, unlike many new formalists, these three thinkers do not believe that everything is conceptually reducible to form, nor that the form of a thing has any necessary relation to what that thing most essentially is. So where more recent new formalists like Levine or McPherson are largely concerned with what we call, borrowing a term from John Ruskin, essential form, and we will return on it in a second. Ruskin, Warburg, and Fossillon, we propose, are after something quite different, a phenomenon which we call inessential form. It is to this distinction that we now turn. Part two, Ruskin, inessential form. Ruskin develops his distinction between essential and inessential form in an analysis of the representation of hair and skin in modern animal painting in his 1849 book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture. In the works of Tintoretto and Peter Paul Rubens, he points out, quote, a peculiar attention is given to the colors, luster, and texture of skin. The picturesque direction of their thoughts is always distinctly recognizable, he explains, as clinging to the surface, to the less essential character, and as developing out of this a sublimity different from that of the creature itself. A sublimity, whether it be sought in the clefts and folds of shaggy hair, or in the chasms and rents of rocks, or in the hanging of thickets or hillsides, or in the alternations of gaiety and gloom in the variegation of the shell, the plume, or the cloud. There's a bit of Rubens for you. <laughs> Ruskin perceives a related attention to the undulating surfaces of material bodies in classical sculpture. Narrating a shift in the representation of hair in ancient Greek to later Roman sculpture, he proposes that while previously hair had been, quote, considered as an excrescence, indicated by a few rude lines and subordinated to the essential form of the figure, unquote, after the time of Pericles, hair begins to take on an increased significance, becoming a crucial site for the workman to elaborate his craft. 
In these later sculptural works, Ruskin writes, quote, while the features and limbs are clumsily and bluntly executed, the hair is curled and twisted, cut into bold and shadowy projections, and arranged in masses elaborately ornamental. What Ruskin calls essential form concerns the basic outline or shape of a thing, figural qualities that allow an entity to be recognizable as what it is, a mountain, a dog, a mother, Jesus, such forms might most basically <laughs> such forms might most basically be said to contain and distinguish between figures, but they might also overlap or recombine, as in the way that an image of a centaur borrows from the essential form of a human and the essential form of a horse. Ruskin's notion of essential form does capture something of Levine's notion of form, in which forms are said to constrain, differ, overlap, and intersect, and travel. Take the example of gender. Gender is a form for Levine in that it constrains social identities, institutes a difference, masculine, feminine, can overlap or intersect with other <coughs> categories like race or class, and travels to organize bodies across space and time. Levine's understanding of gender as a simple form that, and I quote, can impose order here and there on a multiplicity of social material <coughs> is essential in that it names a fundamental and recognizable principle that particular bodies always transcend and escape. In describing Levine's conception of gender here as essential, we in no way mean to imply that it is essentialist. Far from it. Gender, Levine writes, and I quote, is more like a literary form than a fact of nature, a made or crafted shaping of materials, end of quote. Indeed, we might say that Levine's anti-essentialist conception of gender, as well as her approach to literary form, to which gender is here analogized, is part of what makes her notion of form essential in Ruskin's terms. It names the general shape of a socially recognizable entity. But with this concept of inessential form, Ruskin is after something different. Um, inessential forms express not what is fundamental to a thing, and thus what makes it immediately recognizable, but what is excessive or accidental to it. Inessential form concerns temporally variable and environmentally produced qualities that in their changefulness can be said to be inessential of the being of a thing, to the being of a thing. And here we're, we can think about something similar to Agamben's concept of quad libet, for instance, whateverness. Another key aspect of inessential form that we want to stress today is that it operates autonomously from essential form in order to variegate and heighten, but also to express feeling, or what in our contemporary theoretical vocabulary we might call affect. We invoke the word affect here not, as many readers of Deleuze have, to refer to an undifferentiated mass of intensity that never coheres enough to be represented, but rather to name the crystallization of force in the variegated quality of the inessential forms to which Ruskin finds himself so attracted in his discussions of animal skins and hair. Deleuzeans, we want to note merely in passing, have often tended to conceive of affect as formless because they understand affect to, be, to always be a site of transition, disruption, or instability. Such a theory of affect, however, as Eugenie Brinkema has recently pointed out, often relies on an, and I quote, impoverished notion of form as inert, passive, and inactive. By contrast, Ruskin is interested in forms that convey motion and activity. While the phrase in essential form appears only a few times throughout Ruskin's corpus, we would argue that much of his work, especially his thinking on Gothic architecture, is dedicated to a concern with inessentiality. So in much of his work, though most notably in the Stones of Venice, Ruskin traces the appeal of Gothic architecture to its elaborate ornamentation, which manifests the undulating temporality of history through inscriptions on the surface. 
By definition, ornaments could be considered inessential forms in that they physically exceed the structure of the building they adorn. But more than their structural excessiveness, what interests Ruskin about ornaments is their changefulness, a property that emerges because of their specific relation to space-time. Subsisting on the surface of a monument, ornaments are exposed to other bodies in a way that allows them to index history. While a structural component like an arch or a truss remains largely stable over time, ornaments, defined broadly as any aesthetic modulation or any non-functional addition to a three-dimensional figure, are more susceptible to alteration through time. In the context of the Gothic architectural style that, index, that interests Ruskin, ornaments index the body and the mood of the individual workmen who carved them. And yet more than the result of the human, for Ruskin, ornaments are also the product of inhuman forces, as the environment continues to cause alterations to their form. Indeed, any environmental effect in Ruskin, whether weathering, decay, or parasitic growths on the surface of the building, are considered ornamentation, as they add to the vitality of the structure by further modulating its surface. And I think here we can see the connection to Ranjani's discussion of the ethics of the dust, another text by Ruskin, um, in which the little girls become these crystalline ornaments, um, both through their own atomistic jostling, as well as the formative power of the lecture. You kind of have these different um, forces producing their formation over time. So all ornaments, we're, we're arguing in Ruskin, are essential insofar as, like freckles darkened by the sun, they erupt on the surface of a body and are not essential to that body's existence. And they, all, and they are always the result of something we somewhat hesitantly call affect, in that whether the worker's mood or the wind's furor, they are the translation of force into form. In the work of the, 20, the turn of the 20th century German art historian Abby Warburg, we discover another different attempt to theorize form as a, an inessential result of affect, a materialization of emotive force emergent in superfluous detail and ornamental flourish. In our next section, we approach what Warburg called the pathos formal, a concept he obsessively tried to theorize from the end of the 19th century until his death in 1929, somewhat unconventionally as part of the same art historical lineage as Ruskin's in essential form. So part three, Warburg, the pathos formal. Pathos formal, sometimes translated as emotive formula, names the oxymoronic cohabitation of an excessive emotive element, pathos, and a rigid and repetitive element, formal. In his 2007 essay, Nymphs, George Agamben describes Warburg's pathos formal as something, and I quote, whose form punctually coincides with its matter and whose origin is indissoluble from its becoming. Pathos formal are made of time. They are crystals of historical memory, crystals that are phantasmized and around which time writes its choreography." End of quotation. The notion of the pathos formal first emerges in a 1905 essay by Warburg entitled Dürer and Italian Antiquity, but can be traced back to Warburg's attempt to develop what he called a psychomonistic theory of art in the late 1880s and 1890s. Warburg coins the term pathos formal in an attempt to understand why certain forms emerge and reemerge throughout the history of art, crystallizing dynamic emotional energies in frozen gestures and petrified movements. Why, Warburg asks, does the melancholic so often appear as he does, his facial expression always evoking concern and intimate absorption, absorption his hand always below the chin? Why is the expression of feminine exaltation, what Warburg calls the nymph, always captured with stylistic elements such as intricately twisted hair and flowing textiles? For, for Warburg, pathos refers to the emotive quality of art which erupts in varying intensities, in forms that convey motion or feeling, 
while formal po points to a repetitive and performative element, according to which these forms are iteratively reproduced through time. And here one example could be like the formula like in epic poetry, thinking in literary terms, so these epithets that keep like coming back in order to describe characters. Um, when pathos sediments into a particular formula through repetition, a pathos formal can be say to emerge. And here again we might think of Naomi's case bliss rhyme and the way that it repeats throughout time to crystallize a certain emotional form, though always somewhat differently each time. In developing his notion of the pathos formal, Warburg departs from the more iconographic approach to images taken by his predecessors, <laughs> in which the reappearance of forms was often explained in terms of artistic influence and creating a hierarchy between the original and its copies. Warburg rejects this hierarchy in favor of a materialist theory of the artwork as a crystallization of historically contingent affect. The aim of the art historian in Warburg's view is not to uncover the latent symbolic meaning of aesthetic forms, nor is it to reveal the sources that influence their production by, say, tracing the history of the icon, but rather to identify and describe the formal qualities, the angles, patterns, and textures that comprise a given pathos formal. He compares the aim of the art historian to that of a seismographer both study the translation of forces into forms. Warburg's early work on the relationship between emotion and form was inspired by theorists of animal behavior, who had studied how emotions like fear or excitation manifested themselves in the same facial expressions, cries, and gesticulations across space and time. As Spiros Papapetros has shown, like the animals studied by the Italian evolutionary biologist Tito Vignoli, whose excess emotional energy ossified into frozen expressions and stances, quote Papapetros, the human body in Warburg's iconography is petrified by an extreme level of animation that surpasses its capacity to bear it. Oh, I don't have that slide. But how exactly does one identify a pathos formal? Where and how does Warburg find the traces of these recurrent patterns of expression? For Warburg, the pathos formal is located primarily in apparently marginal details, such as surface ornamentation, gestures, and what he called accessories in motion, bewegtes Beiwerk. In Florence, some 20 years uh, some 24 years ago, he writes in a 1912 essay, I realized that the influence of antiquity manifested itself in Quattrocento secular painting, and specifically in that of Botticelli and Filippino Lippi, through a change of depiction of human figures, an increased mobility of the body and of its draperies, inspired by antique visual art and poetry. What we want to propose here is that Ruskin's notion of inessentiality is elevated in Warburg's pathos formal through a th to a theory of affect as materialized in aesthetic form. Inessentiality is that residual formal element of the image wherein historically produced emotions such as fear, melancholy, or desire can affect viewers that inhabit the same historical affective system. The duality of the pathos formal, in which the abstractness of the formula coexists alongside the concreteness of the pathos expression, suggests a much different conception of form than that which Kramnik and Narcissian had called reductionist. For reductionists like Levine, anything and everything can be or have a form, and any form can take on any meaning. For Ruskin and Warburg, however, as well as for Faucillon, as we'll show in our fourth section, not everything has an, an inessential form or expresses a pathos formal. And the meaning of these forms is not arbitrary, at least not in the usual sense of the term. Part four, 
Fusion, The Life of Forms. One of the most significant and original claims of Fossillon's 1934 book, The Life of Forms, is that forms are marked by an intransitive quality, which falls outside the realm of meaning. And I quote, whereas an image implies the representation of an object and a sign signifies an object, he writes, form signifies only itself. So here the first interesting thing is like this tripartite like differentiation between image, sign, and form that sometimes are taught together. While signs and images have a symbolic and referential quality that situates them always within a linguistically structured system of signification, form names a material quality which operates according to its own non-referential logic. And here I'm using like a linguistic analogy because like, uh, Fosiong himself keeps elaborating this, but we, we are going to um, focus on that in a second. Um, in other words, where signs and images point to things other than themselves, forms do not. Again, they are intransitive. Fosiong's distinction between the non-referential quality of form and the representational quality of both sign and image opens up a question about the arbitrariness of meaning, which might, at least initially, remind us of the deconstructive emphasis on an inexorable gap between signifier and signified. We see this deconstructive legacy persisting in Levine's conceptualization of form as an empty structure, which can be meaningfully politicized in different ways according to the subject who gives them meaning. As Kramnik and Narcissian point out in their reading of Levine, for her, although form is always political, there is no necessary relation between particular forms and particular kinds of politics. These beliefs give rise to a certain verbal tick in her style, in which she repeatedly uses the phrase, I endorse or I approve, to express her own opinion about how a particular form is functioning to promote either equality or inequality. <laughs> This is the kind of the best part of their essay, I think. <laughs> As Kramnik and Narcessian write, for Levin, one need, one need only add a personal approval or disapproval to the recognition of a form in order to arrive at a political conclusion. Sometimes forms lead to the redistribution of the world's wealth. Sometimes they organize atro atrocity and oppression. One approves of the first, and one doesn't <laughs> approve of the second. And it is the act of the approving or disapproving that recognizes the existence of not only a form, but also the politics it represents and the politics it demands. And we are quoting this not just to like, as like a, something against Levin per se, but like against a certain reading of the construction that I think this, this quotation captures quite well what kind of like seems like um, dubious about it. Um, but maybe yeah, we can go back to that in the Q&A. In other words, for Levin, who we read in a deconstructive vein as emphasizing the arbitrariness of the sign, because forms never have their own meaning, politics consists in the viewer or reader imposing his or her, her own meaning on forms, depending on whether or not those forms are doing what one personally wants them to do. Faucillon, however, forces us to consider a possibility quite difficult for a scholar writing in the wake of deconstruction, including ourselves, to accept. That forms, even those produced and read by human subjects, have an inherent logic and meaning of their own. Can form, he writes, then be nothing more than a void? Is it only a cipher wandering through space, forever in pursuit of a number that forever flees from it? He asks, anticipating Derrida's interest for pure signifiers with no signification, as well as, one might argue, Levine's liberal functionalist extension of this paradigm. By no means, he answers. Form has a meaning, but it is a meaning entirely its own a personal and specific value that must not be confused with the attributes we impose upon it. Thus, Faucillon puts us on the trail of forms and their non-arbitrary and non-subjective power. As Faucillon suggests, while meanings can no doubt be imposed upon forms, the process through which forms are transformed into signs what we might call representationalism, but also iconography, 
is a critical approach, a disposition toward art which needs to be conceptually distinguished from the life of forms itself. New meanings can be attached to forms. Old meanings can be detached from them. In other words, forms can become signs and signs can become forms. But forms themselves keep wavering, going through their own circuits of non-communication, marked by autonomous processes of the accretion and sloughing off of meanings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Faucion asks his reader to consider the example of the interlace, an aesthetic form that emerges first as a sign before taking on a life of its own as a form. While the medical origin of this sign cannot be doubted, he writes, eventually the sign becomes a form and in the world of forms, it gives rise to a whole series of shapes that subsequently bear no relation whatsoever to their origin. The interlace, for instance, lends itself to innumerable variations in the decoration of the architectural monuments of certain East Christian sects. It may weave various shapes into single indissoluble ornaments. It may submit to syntheses that artfully conceal the relationship of their component parts or it may evoke from that genius for analysis so typical of Islam the construction and isolation of completely stylized patterns. In Ireland, the interlace appears as a transitory but endlessly renewed meditation on a chaotic universe that deep within itself clasps and conceals the debris or the seeds of humankind. The interlace twines round and round the old iconography and devours it. It creates a picture of the world that has nothing in common with the world, and an art of thinking that has nothing in common with thought. We want to flag here, through Faucillon's example of the interlace, the difference between his approach to form and that of two recent phases of literary criticism, the construction with what Susan Wolfson has called its interest in form-dissolving theories of language and a subsequent new historicism with its interest in how literary form resolves social contradictions at a false level of aesthetic experience. The interlace can, in Faucillon's terms, neither be understood as the consolidation of an historical event or social conflict, though it might result from one, nor is it a kind of reminder or surplus of thought. It creates, and I quote, it creates a picture of the world that has nothing in common with the world and an art of thinking that has nothing in common with thought. The interlace, like the self-devouring snake it sometimes figures, consumes its own meanings, meanings both historical and ideational. Mo Moving towards the conclusion, we want to meditate briefly on the implications for literary theory of Faucillon's understanding of form as, and I quote, an extrusion upon the word. For us, as literary scholars thinking with and through the lineage of Ruskin, Warburg, and Faucillon, form is not only something to which a work of literature or any artwork can be conceptually reduced, a poem reduced strategically to its rhythm or a novel to the structure of its Bildungsroman narrative for the purpose of a reading, though again we do not so much dismiss this understanding of form as we want to differentiate our own. Rather, we, we, what we have been calling inessentiality of form is something that has to do with the ornamental quality of language, that quality that emerges when words begin to function less as signs and more as forms. And we think sometimes that can happen in literature. <laughs> so our final section, um, from sign to form, toward an inessential theory of language. It might come as a surprise, given all his attention to the non-significatory and non-symbolic aspects of form, that Faucillon modeled his study, The Life of Forms, after a work of historical linguistics, Arzen Darmstädter's 1886 study, The Life of Words, which attempted to reveal how, quote, languages are living organisms whose life, though a purely intellectual one, is nonetheless real and is in truth comparable to that of plants and animals. 
Darmstädter's aim was that of studying words as characterized by cycles of life and death according to models derived from the natural sciences, um, in particular that of Darwin. What seems to have attracted Faucillon to Darmstädter's project was the possibility of thinking the linguistic signifier not merely as a site of meaning, but as a formal accretion of matter that underwent phonetic alterations and grammatical changes over time, especially when left unregulated by educational systems or other cultural bodies. Following Darmstädter, Faucillon, we would argue, asks us to think about the word not only as sign, but as form. Forms, Faucillon writes, quote, tend to manifest themselves with extraordinary vigor. This may, for example, be observed as regard to language, where the verbal sign can become the mold for many different interpretations, and, having attained form, experience many remarkable adventures. When a sign becomes a form and starts going on its remarkable adventures, it transforms from the bearer of worldly meaning into what Faucillon calls an extrusion upon the world. What we're reading as a kind of ornament that continues to both mold and be molded, whisked away from the meaning it may have originally had or the meaning it was given by its author and conditioning its own future interpretations through the active transformation of its context. Let's recall here Ruskin's conceptualization of ornaments. As inessential forms, ornaments are accidental elaborations of surface that result from an effective encounter. In Ruskin's account, often that of the laborer's body or environmental forces with the surface matter of the architectural structure. What Faucillon adds to this account of ornamentation is the power of the ornament also to shape its own context and its own field of emergence. Or what we might think of in a more literary vein as the word qua form's capacity to shape its future encounters. Ornament, Faucillon writes, shapes, straightens, and stabilizes the bare and arid field on which it is inscribed. Not only does it exist in and of itself, but it also shapes its own environment, to which it imparts a form. The word qua form, thus, is not only passively formed, but actively forms. It is the index of an effective encounter, because it is never um, so let me start over. It is the index of an effective encounter that, because it is never a direct translation of that encounter, but an ornamentation or extrusion upon it, continues to affect those who encounter it. What we are after here is not so much, or not only, what others have called the materiality of the signifier as what we take to be the distinctly formal material quality of language that allows it to be affected by the reality it also shapes. Charles Sanders Peirce captures something of what we mean when he describes the index, and I quote, as a sign which refers to the object that it denotes by virtue of being really affected by that object, or elsewhere, and I quote, as a sign which refers to its object not so much because of any similarity or analogy with it, as because it is in dynamical, including spatial connection, both with the individual object on the one end and with the senses of the person for whom it serves as a sign on the other. Faucillon, for his part, in his thinking of words as forms, asks us to think of forms as the, and I quote Faucillon, the graph of inactivity. The word graph here, from the Greek graphe, writing, but also drawing, sculpting, is significantly a term that pertains as much to language as to the visual arts, as well as the mechanical recording of natural phenomena. We might think here of the inscription of movements into images undertaken by 19th century physiological experiments in movement, as those of Jules-Étienne Marais, or to the early studies of movement and gesture, such as those of Edward Muybridge, who paved the way for the birth of cinema. However, Faucillon warns us about two possible dangers in considering form as the graph of an activity. The first 
is of stripping it bare, and I quote, reducing it to a mere contour or diagram. This is the risk of considering form only in its essential quality, we argue. We have exemplified this tendency largely through the work of Levine, but we might also here think of the literary ecosystems of Franco Moretti, which in their graphing of the life and death of genres over time might at first seem compatible with Faucillon's approach. But Moretti's way of taxonomizing genres, this novel is Gothic, this other is realist, this other is modernist, is based on a conception of literature that we are calling essential. Plot and style are the decisive markers that allow him to organize his data, and words are merely symbols, always translatable, that denote points in space and time. Form in Moretti becomes simply a synonymous of genre. According to Faucillon, we must resist the tendency to think of form in these reductive terms, in these reductive terms, and, and I quote, instead envisage form in all its fullness and, its all, and in all its many phases. Form, that is, as a construction of space and matter, whether it be uh, manifested by the equilibrium of its masses, by variations from light to dark, by tone, by stroke, by spotting whether it be architectural, sculptural, painted, or engraved. Understood in this way, words qua forms are not a representation of things. They, become, they tend to become things themselves. The second danger that Faucillon identifies in considering form <coughs> as the graph of an activity is that of separating the graph from the activity and of considering the latter by itself alone. And so we're kind of thinking of this second danger um, as a tendency of certain, um, what we've in one way named as a certain way of conceptualizing affect as this kind of formless force that can be separated from the, the forms that produce it. We might also think of David Cunningham's um, idea that um, life cannot be thought separately from form, that they need to be thought together, um, or certain new materialist approaches to aesthetics, um, which think about the kind of amorphousness of of a material which would then later get formed. Um, in other words, the activity or eruption of force should always be thought together with the form that carries it, or rather can't be thought separately from it. The word that thus becomes a marker, if also a cadaverous marker, of this activity. Faucillon's particular contribution to the inessential paradigm we've been trying to unearth today, and here we'll conclude, lies in his attempt to theorize a non-representational aesthetic paradigm based on a materialist interest in the biomorphic aspect of both images and words. It is this biomorphic aspect that connects Faucillon's life of forms to Warburg's notion of the pathos formal. At the core of Warburg's project, as we saw, was the attempt to foreground a notion of aesthetics that moved away from a conception of the author as creator of the aesthetic artifact, and that considered artworks as the products of impersonal energies, kinetic and potential, that sedimented into historical forms. Like Warburg's pathos formal, moreover, Ruskin's notion of an inessential form and Faucillon's notion of the life of forms aim to bypass a dichotomic distinction between object and subject as well as organic and inorganic, foregrounding an understanding of forms, both artistic and natural, as fallen contingencies, which sediment through a combination of effective forces. Art, Faucillon writes, is made up not of the artist's intentions, but of works of art. It lies under our eyes and under our hands, and as a kind of extrusion upon a world that has nothing whatsoever in common with it, save the pretext of an image. Thanks.